this is a loaf of my sourdough bread that I made this week just past and um, this as well is a sourdough discard chocolate cake that I also made but in this video I want to take you back to where it began when I opened my sourdough starter and found this. It is called Serratia marcescens and it is a bacteria that grows it can be really bad for us. It is known for causing UTIs and um, it is very popular in wet environments, especially bathrooms, laundries, kitchen sinks, things like that. Um, it is definitely not something that is only found in sourdough starters, but it is definitely not something that you want in your sourdough starter. And when you Google this, when you read most, if not all, sourdough starter blogs and recipes and how-tos, they're going to tell you to throw it out. But um, I'm going to choose not to. <laughs> I'm going to choose that because I have saved my sourdough starter from mold in the past, from all sorts of things. It has been smelling really funky sometimes to the point where I suspected that it could be rotten. And instead, I just chose to save it and it's always bounced back. So with this one too, I mean, I'm definitely not going to use it. I'm not going to use it today, not going to use it tomorrow, not going to use it for a week. But I am going to try and save it. So I want to share with you a little bit about sourdough starter. Okay, so a healthy sourdough starter is a healthy yeast culture. It's a yeast culture taken from bacteria and things in the air. Now, healthy yeast cultures produce both lactic and acetic acids from about 3.5 to 5 pH levels, which both of these levels from either minimum or maximum are toxic to molds and most bacteria. All right, so... Once your healthy yeast environment, which your healthy sourdough starter, has been reclaimed by you once you find it and you realize it's moldy, it's stinky, um, the healthy yeast is going to kill off the, the bacteria and the molds that are causing the, the smell and the look, you know, all the icky stuff on your sourdough starter. Again, though, the pathogens, which we'll call it, which is simply the bacteria that we don't want in our sourdough starter, they're always there. But when you're keeping your sourdough starter healthy, you are just controlling the population to healthy levels. So all you're doing is just making sure that you have more of the good than the bad bacteria in your sourdough starter. Very much like in our own bodies, our body itself likes to make sure that we have more of the good than the bad bacteria. When I opened my sourdough starter and I realized, okay, it's, it's not looking good, I've forgotten about it, which happens rarely, but when it does, I don't panic and I just know this is a living thing. This is something that I can repair, essentially. So, um, and I know that I might be getting some hate, I might be getting people telling me that I'm wrong, but I've done this multiple times, not so much with the pink discoloration, but with other molds, like I've had serious mold situations, and I'm talking like real mold, like none of that, like that, none of the fake yeast stuff. You can see that I have some of the white stuff floating in the top. That's just a yeast that isn't actually mold or anything. I'm talking like fuzzy mold all over my sourdough starter. And I know that there would have been spores all through my sourdough starter, but I also knew that if I took the time to feed it and to get it healthy again, that the natural enzymes and cultures and acids from given off from the good bacteria would kill and essentially outnumber the bad bacteria. So that is why this time I decided to take the risk and save my sourdough starter. I saved my sourdough starter simply by taking out around 50 grams of as clean a sample I could find. So scraping off all of the um, hardened crust on the top with all the pink streaks, removing as many of the pink streaks from um, in the sourdough starter, which was mostly in the top. And then from the bottom, I took a couple of tablespoons full. I simply fed the sourdough starter like I usually do. I don't weigh. I don't weigh or measure my ingredients. I never have. I just look for a consistency that I know is right. So usually I aim for a thick cake batter. I do find that in the summertime, I need a thicker sourdough starter in order to feed it once. So I will feed it until it's like a thick brownie batter, so it's quite stiff to mix. 
and then during the winter time when my kitchen's a lot colder and it takes a lot longer to rise to the top of its cycle I will feed it a little bit less flour so that it can eat through the new feed a little bit quicker and I still get that nice bubbly rise every 12 hours. Another thing to make sure, which is why I'm wondering why it might have gone a bit icky this time, was that the jar was sealed. When you're keeping a sourdough starter, make sure that you, do, again, don't have plastics in your jar like that one was, and don't keep the jar sealed. Make sure it has access to air. Essentially, what your sourdough starter is, is a is a product that you're creating to draw the yeasts and the natural bacteria from the air into your starter and creates a yeast so um, make sure that you always have your sourdough starter in the air and don't seal the jar i usually never seal the jar this is a new jar and i realized i've forgotten to take off that plastic and let the lid sit properly and if it's just out of my bench, if you don't have vinegar flies or anything like that at certain times of the year, then just sit it out on the bench with some cheesecloth over it or even just alone and let it really thrive that way. So tonight I want to take you through my um, usual sort of late night sourdough routine. And I thought this would be a great loaf to try out my sourdough starter and see how healthy it is and see what kind of dough I wake up to in the morning. I know when it comes to baking sourdough loaves, it can seem scary, but really I just imagine a woman in a small cottage surrounded by children who is tired and probably a bit over baking and she just wants a minimal effort loaf to feed hungry children. Unless I'm just thinking of me, that's that's possible. Maybe that's just my own lifestyle. I'm summing up into my sourdough journey. But I do always imagine like a, a woman in an apron 200 years ago on some prairie with sourdough and she only had her own sourdough. And I think that these days now that sourdough has come back and it's been all over the internet, it can be so over complicated and it has become extremely scientific and it's, I think that sourdough is, can be so natural to work with if you just take the time to do what suits you. It is something that in the last four years I've learned how to make my own and how to uh, cook for my family and cook to our tastes. And it's actually not very often that I make a proper artesian sourdough loaf. My kids can't handle the really thick, chewy crust. And so, especially if it's a day old and we're having it with toast, like if we want to have, you know, eggs on toast, or if we just want to have a piece of toast or French toast, then it's really hard for them to eat and they just don't eat it. So for me, I actually have learned, I always bake and make my doughs more dense. They don't have that beautiful look to them they aren't they definitely are instagram worthy but it is a loaf that gets me through sometimes in fact in this video i have overproofed all my loaves because i'm constantly forgetting them i'm constantly busy and running into the kitchen realizing that i left my sourdough in the bowl too long i left it in the shaving basket too long or i left it in the oven too long and it's just part of life. Some loaves can be beautiful and perfect and quite a lot of loaves are not. The recipe for the loaf that I've made um, is around a third of a cup of sourdough starter and one and a half cups of water and two decent pinches of salt and about four cups of flour. I mix that up until it's a really sh like a dry shaggy dough. And this allows me to not have to um, stretch and fold. This is the kind of dose that I do when it's 9 p.m., sometimes even 10 p.m. I want bread in the morning. I want bread for dinner the next day or for lunch, and I don't have time to do the stretch and folds. I do it, leave it in a really shaggy, dry dough, and then just let it do its thing all night. And you will wake up, hopefully, to a dough that is softer, moist, and ready to be kneaded and worked with just like you would a normal dough for a normal loaf of bread. It is thick and stiff and strong 
and so you can work with it really easily and without the fuss and without a lot of the mess. Tonight I'm going to reserve my sourdough starter for a recipe that I'm going to do tomorrow morning. Okay, so this is the next morning. This is the dough. So I left it as a really dry, shaggy dough. And this is what I'm waking up to. It's still not super pretty. And to be honest, it hasn't risen as much as it would usually. So I'm guessing that's down to my sourdough starter, which, you know, has been taken from pretty unhealthy to healthy in seven days. So I'm It'll just take a few more times, a few more bakes before I get a great rise to my dough. chocolate which I like because I'm baking all the time and I do try and save my expensive cooking chocolate and copious amounts of butter for special occasions. This cake uses two and a half cups of starter so it's definitely one where if you don't have a large starter going to you can hoard the starter in the fridge in a jar until you have around two two and a half cups and then you can make this cake. I definitely recommend that you try it. It is one of my favorite cakes to make. It's easy, it tastes nice, it keeps really well. Um, it's spongy and moist and yeah, it is definitely a favorite in my house. The recipe I will link below. It is my sourdough discard sponge cake.
that's all for now. I hope this video was helpful if you have thought that you had to throw out your salary starter. I'm here to hopefully give you some encouragement that you do not have to and I have a whole blog post on the subject of serratia mass sessions which you can read and I have linked the scientific articles on what the pathogen really is, on how, where it is in our homes, on how it's treated and how it really exists in our bodies and in our environment and therefore how it works in our sourdough starters and how we can um, not be afraid of finding the dreaded pink streaks in our sourdough starter. If you liked this video, hit the like button for me and until next time, bye.